Hi everyone, welcome to Frontier Patriot. Today we have a lovely meal that Justine has prepared that is a family favorite. So today we'll be talking about our family's favorite and our favorite uh, dishes to make. Dishes to make mm -hmm. and to eat. Yes, but first let's serve ourselves up. This is actually, I would say my top three favorite dishes to have. So yes, I'm a very cheap date because all you need is some potatoes and onions and I'm happy. But it's so good. <laughs> I told Ron I could literally just eat all this by myself, so I'm a little grumpy that we have to split it. <laughs> but it is what it is. Gotta be nice. <laughs> Thank you. Is that enough? Of course not. But, well, you take however much you think you're gonna eat, okay. and then give me what's left. Alright. <laughs> oh, that hurts. <laughs> So what is this I'm scooping out on the plate here so that people know? My mom, we just literally call it potato and eggs. It is what it is. <laughs> it's fried potatoes and eggs together um, with a little bit of salt and some lemon juice. And then this is just an onion salad. Very, very cheap and you could have it all year round. That is just sliced up raw onions, dried dill, a bit of salt and more lemon juice. And the lemon that I used for all of this was only half of a lemon. So it's a very economic dish, especially by modern standards. And the story behind this is my mom grew up very, very poor. My mom literally was born to a midwife in a mud one room house in Northern Syria. And her and all of her siblings, they lived together in this one room. And they didn't have meat very often. They couldn't afford it. They only had meat maybe once a week. Sometimes not even that much. Maybe once every other week. And usually it's because my grandpa would have to hunt it. He would go bird shooting. So this was their luxury dish that they would have usually on Sundays. Um, I don't know if it's because it was just a lot of work that went into it or what. But it was their Sunday favorite dish. And my, my grandma... Her name's Surma. We call her Yumi Surma because that's how you say it in Aramaic. Because my mom's family, they're Assyrians. Assyrians are an ancient uh, group of people. They're mentioned in the Bible. They speak modern Aramaic, which is a language Jesus spoke, at least the closest to it that we have today that's still spoken by a group of surviving people. Mm -hmm. So very, very old Christian group and a very old group of people in general. Well, before we eat, can we say a little prayer? Yes. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, could you eat it? All right. We'll keep it simple and mm -hmm. short for you guys. Hey, Lord, thank you for this food that Justine has prepared. Thank you for uh, allowing us to do what we can do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. This is very good. Very cheap, very good. My mom told me that she would come home to school, she'd walk back from school, and she'd smell potato and eggs being cooked down the street, and she would run. Okay, this was really good. You made me nervous when you squirted the lemon juice on the potatoes <laughs> and i'm not a big fan of onions you know that but yeah. together he doesn't like raw onions this is amazing it is really really good the only thing that can make it any better would maybe be a little bit of bacon chopped up in there but without it this <laughs> is really good <laughs> oh i'm sure back in the day in the village they would say the same thing meat would make this so much better but this is really okay, really no. good i don't i don't personally miss the meat no i'm not missing it there's protein from the eggs. Mmm. Looks so good. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite dishes. You can have it all year round too. Before anybody asks where we can see this being made, you can see this being made, this meal, on Early American Channel. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I show myself making it there, and then we eat it here. Mm -hmm. And thanks to everybody that's watched mm -hmm. our Valentine's Day video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That got a, good, a lot of good reviews, and thanks for watching the cookie stamp video. That one almost didn't happen. <laughs> I, uh, I lost a memory card there for a it. few days, and uh, about midnight, I found it. But anyways, it mm -hmm. went out, and a lot of people seemed to like it, so uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is so good. Yeah, it is really good. We're going to finish it. all of it. I mean it. I really mean it. Thank you. <laughs> we'll eat like kings even if we make barely anything. 
If we have the income of a peasant, we'll eat like kings. Mm -mm. I never get tired of it. <laughs> so, Ron, since we're talking about our parents and the, the traditional foods that our parents have taught us how to make, and this is from my mom, mm -hmm. what is your m favorite dish that your mom makes? Safe <laughs> answer, all of them. <laughs> That's safe. My favorite thing that my mom makes. <clears throat> that is tough to answer. She makes an excellent white bean chili. But meatloaf, mm -hmm. I love meatloaf. But I also love the simple nights when it's just pork chop. Mm -hmm. Pork, you know, uh, fried in the, the skillet, pork chop with gravy and mashed potatoes. That just brings back the memories. He likes biscuits. I do like biscuits. But if I had to say anything that... Mm -hmm. I can point to in particular, meatloaf. She makes an excellent meatloaf. Yeah, you make really good meatloaf. Thank you. And I make it completely different than my mother. He actually makes the best meatloaf I've ever had in my life. It's so moist. I'm sorry I had to use mm. that word. But it's so moist, and the meat is just perfect. So, my mom makes <laughs> excellent meatloaf, but it's like a very 1960s style, traditional with the ketchup on top and just all beef. That's good. I like that. And she thickens it with uh, oats instead of cracker crumbs or bread crumbs. So you want me to tell a little bit about how I make mine or? A little bit. Okay. So mm -hmm. mine is 50-50 uh, lean beef and uh, Italian sausage or pork. And then uh, I'll use you know all your regular spices, mm -hmm. the, the garlic, the basil, the oregano, the thyme. And I'll even put a little bit of rosemary in there, salt and pepper. Uh, eggs go in it mm -hmm. and then uh, I crush up cracker crumbs and then uh, it's been a while since I made it what else do I put in there? I, I uh, dice up really finely or mince up you should say uh, red onion and then uh, green pepper I put that in there and then I put it in a loaf and the, the trick to not having a dense meatloaf that's you know really solid because you don't want your meatloaf like a rock is don't overwork it so use your hands and like just... Like bread dough. You don't yeah. want to overwork it. So when I'm divvying up the meat, I'll almost layer it kind of. I'll do half of my beef in pieces, half of my pork in pieces, put my ingredients, and then do the other half of my meat. And I'll just kind of just give it a toss, like if, uh, treat it like a salad. So you mm. don't overwork it. And then you put it in your pan. Mm. You stick that in the oven. And then uh, halfway through, I don't put ketchup on mine. I... How about the grape jelly? Oh yeah, it's it's a concoction mm -hmm. of sweet, savory kind of. It's like a barbecue sauce with some mustard, uh, and uh, equal equal proportion of that with grape jelly. So it's got like, and I'll put uh, like some red pepper in there so it gets so it's hot, but it's it's hard to explain, but it's really good, and it gets sticky. And you put that on top of it. I put that on top of it uh, when it's got when it, when it's about halfway done. I'll I'll do that. And when it's about halfway done, that's when you should really drain the grease. If you have a lot of grease, if you use uh, like 60 uh, or what is it, 80 20, that's pretty right. greasy beef. I try to use the lean beef where I don't have to really drain off the grease because it, it can be difficult to do sometimes. You want more? Yes. Anyways, that's my <laughs> spiel on meatloaf. <laughs> he makes really good meatloaf and really good chicken salad. When I first met him like the first month or two oh, yeah, i already that. knew that i was gonna marry this guy because of his chicken salad <laughs> i know it sounds so silly but that chicken salad is amazing i won't tell you how to make that oh this is so good mm -hmm. so what about you I know this is your mom's recipe, but what's your favorite thing to eat? That my mom makes? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it'll sound silly besides this, obviously, but my mom makes the best rice. And rice is an art. You can study your whole life to try to master rice and still not get it right. So the way she does it is she soaks the rice. She always uses jasmine rice. She soaks it 
And this is the way that her mom taught her and then her mom taught her and so on and so forth. You have to soak it like you would soak dry beans overnight or at least for an hour or two. Um, and then you cook it with only one cup of water. If you look up anywhere, it'll say you have to double the water to rice ratio. But since you soaked it, you don't have to do that and it'll become mushy. And then she cooks it with oil, chicken stock powder, and she cooks it also in chicken broth water. It's really good. Yeah, I, I still don't understand quite how she does it. I don't understand her mysteries of rice. <laughs> because I've tried making it exactly like how she does, and it never turns out as good as how she does it. Hmm. Because it's not mushy at all. Each grain just separates perfectly from the other grain. It doesn't stick together. So I've never met anyone else that makes rice as good as my mom makes rice. And sometimes the simplest things can be the hardest to master. I mean, people will spend their whole lives trying to make bread. Mm -hmm. You think bread, you take it for granted. You eat bread nearly every day. Rice, too, you take it for granted. But it's the hardest thing to master is the simplest foods. But I'm working on it. It's in progress. <laughs> What's your least favorite food? That my mom makes? No. Just in general. What's oh. your least favorite food to eat? Well, greasy food. <clears throat> I'll admit. My stomach can't handle greasy food. I enjoy greasy food sometimes, but I do mm. feel quite guilty about it. But uh, anything to do with fish or seafood. Oh, I love seafood. I'm not real big on it, but I, I can choke down a mm. piece of fried fish mm -hmm. if I drowned it in ketchup. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. But that's pretty much it. I love barbecue. Yeah. Barbecue is good. Especially if it's the, the hot, spicy kind. <clears throat> I'm very open-minded about food. Very. Well, actually, you know what I think about? The only things I won't eat... I have a list of them. And I'm to I've told you this list before. I will mm -hmm. not eat brain. Because <laughs> it just seems immoral. Don't you want to get smarter? Well, it don't work like that. I wish it did. Plus, why would I want to absorb the intelligence of a cow? <laughs> I don't know. Find where the best grass is. Yeah. So I will never eat brain because I think it's immoral. It's like eating someone's memories or something. That's just mm. not my thing. But I know some people, they'll eat it with uh, scrambled eggs. I think it just sounds gross. <laughs> that as well. It's also incredibly unhealthy for you. It has, the brain is made up just of a cholesterol. Mm. So if you eat like a serving of brain, which, oh gosh, that sounds gross even saying, but you're eating like 4,000% of your daily value of cholesterol. So I will not eat brain. I will not eat eyes and I will not eat reproductive organs. So those are the three things that I will never eat. But anything else, I'm very open-minded. Now, obviously, bad food's bad food. I don't want to eat greasy food. Some people like greasy food, but I don't like it because it upsets my stomach. But that's about it. I'm very open-minded when it comes to food. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I know some people, they eat, they eat eyeball tacos and... Nope. Not me. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I won't. tacos. Eat. That's a thing. Now, tongue tacos are really good. Tongue tacos are where it's at. <laughs> Those are actually my favorite. <laughs> We have to eat some good food next weekend at the rendezvous. Right, because I'll be there, so I'll cook. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys are in uh, the Missouri area and looking mm -hmm. for something to do, come on down to uh, the town. is called Old Mines, and it's called the rendezvous. It is old. Yeah, Old Mines Rendezvous. It's an 18th century town. Yep. It was originally a little trading post mm -hmm. with the French and the Indians out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, next weekend, they're having a, a rendezvous. Ron's dad's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father's going to be there. We're going to do some mm -hmm. campfire cooking, as mm -hmm. he likes to call it. He made this spoon. Yeah, that's his spoon. He's recently gotten into spoon carving. He's getting better at a really quick rate, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah, the more you do, the, the better you become. Of course. He's got me beat. I couldn't do it. There's no way. Mm -hmm. I'm not a carver, as you guys seen in the cookie stamp video. Mm -hmm. Some of you probably cringed on that. That was the first time I've ever carved anything. Yeah, making furniture is one thing, but then carving, 
That's another thing. But no, that's a nice spoon. Yeah. For for serving, or I mean, you can even eat with it. Mhm. Mm like a, a soup or something, you know. That'd be good. You're right. And I know somebody's gonna ask, how can we buy it? Dad does not have a website or anything. If you, you have really, to come to Old Mines. Yeah, come to Old Mines or St. Genevieve or Candy Store. If you really want it, maybe send us a ten dollar bill and your return address, and, <laughs> and we'll mail, we'll it mail to you, you one. <laughs> but thank you because um, if even a single person wants to get these spoons, your dad is going to be very yeah. flattered, yeah. very very flattered. I've told him many times the spoons are nice, and he just laughs. But I can tell in his eyes that he's really happy that he's getting compliments on his wood carving. Yeah, I think he does a good job. He does. I think he'll have a good time mm -hmm. at the rendezvous next weekend. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me, we gotta prepare for our trip. It's a two days walk, maybe three, depending on how fast we walk. I know. And they're calling for snow on It's Wednesday. gonna be cold. People think we're crazy. We really do this stuff. Oh, and we really are crazy. We are. In a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. There's crazy in a bad way, and then there's crazy in a good way, I guess. I mean, what better way to... Uh, We're crazy in a good way, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. What better it's up way to you to decide. What better way to teach history mm -hmm. than to live it mm -hmm. and the full experience, right? Mm-hmm. Right. You really like this? I really do. <laughs> Bacon would be like the cherry on top, but this is good. That this would make it good. a breakfast dish for sure. Yeah. I mean, this kind of did remind me of breakfast, but yeah, mm -hmm. the bacon would definitely make mm -hmm. it breakfast. Yeah. So when my mom and her family ate it, it wasn't a breakfast thing. Dinner time. Yeah, it was actually the main meal of the day kind of thing. Mm. They would eat twice a day. <clears throat> They'd have breakfast, which was very big. You'd have flatbread, you'd have yogurt, cheese, and uh, maybe milk. And that was it for them. But nowadays, they would also have jams and tea, things like that. Mm. And then the main meal of the day, they'd have it around four to five, and it would just be a huge meal. Which I know it, you sound, it sounds like you'd be starving by then, but I think they get used to it. Yeah, you get used and to it. And then you'd have a little light snack before bed. That's another thing they would do. And normally raw onions really burn my stomach. I can't just eat raw onions. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way. <laughs> uh huh. But when you put the lemon juice on it and the dill and the salt and you mix it with other foods in your belly and in your mouth, somehow it doesn't burn you. Yeah, it's, it's totally different. It's different. I think the lemon juice really does that. Right, and the salt maybe too. Right, but my mom, oh my gosh, she'll literally eat a raw onion like it's an apple. That's how my mom is. What is it with moms and eating raw onions? I don't know. I can't do that. <laughs> the, the only time that you'll see me eat raw onions besides this is uh, like a big old juicy cheeseburger. I want everything on it. I want the right. full effect. I want the lettuce. I want the tomato, the pickles, the mustard, the ketchup, right. and the mayo, and the cheese, <laughs> and the onions. And did I say pickles? Uh, yes, Pickles, yeah. I want, I want it where it's, you know, just dripping. Nasty. <laughs> That's a good burger. Yeah, that is a good burger. But I won't, I won't even have onions on my salads. Usually I'll ask to have them without because mm -hmm. raw onions will just burn my, my stomach really bad. But yeah. this doesn't. This doesn't burn my stomach. So if you normally have digestive issue, issues with either garlic or um, onion, try this out. It might yeah. work out. Yeah. Or just have a, like one little tiny bite, and if you feel it, it's hurting you, just stop there. Because I don't know, everyone's different. But at mm -hmm. least for me, it doesn't burn my stomach. Yeah, it doesn't burn. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, cooked onions, I can eat cooked onions from here till tomorrow, and it never burns my stomach. But mm -hmm. raw onions will. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, I guess they're harder to digest. Mm -hmm. They have some some compound, however you say the compound in them, that makes them... Um, Does something in your stomach that burns? I'm not a scientist. I don't know. Right. I'm not a scientist. I just eat food. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, you want to talk about our uh, mattress stuffing experience? Yes, we did that earlier today. <clears throat> and I am very pleased with the outcome, I have to say. It is a lot more comfortable than what we thought. But right. We, but we really worked the straw 
and hey to get it. We massaged it. Yeah. You have to break it apart really good. And I think a big trick is to put the straw in the edges of the bed instead of in the center because then it just becomes really lumpy. But you have to make sure it's all even, especially around the edges. You got to compact it in the edges really well. Because then the ones in the middle don't have anywhere to go. So the, mm -hmm. the more you can stuff it, the better. Right. I have been on straw mattresses before, but ours is somehow the most comfortable one I've ever been on. <laughs> because we made it. Yeah, and it might be also because it's really fresh. We just <laughs> did it. Whereas the ones that I've tried before at old houses are probably they've been sitting there for 20 years, you know. Possibly. They're for display purposes only. <laughs> so they've probably been sitting there for 20 years. And the bed that we <laughs> got, it's a rope bed. Yeah. But it's not the kind with the holes on the rails. It's got peds. So that was pretty neat. It was actually it's different. easier to run the ropes because you didn't have to snake all the rope through those eyelets. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot quicker to do. Yeah, a friend of ours gave that to us. He also, he lives yeah. or either in or around St. Genevieve. In St. Genevieve. He's, a, he's another reenactor. <laughs> he was in uh, the voting video that's also on Frontier yes. Patriot. That, that was uh, Doug and his wife too. She was in it too. Doug and Donna. Right. They yeah. run the Felix Valley House in, in uh, Saint, Saint Genevieve. Saint Genevieve. Yeah. Yeah, and Doug, his thing is he is a really good seamstress. Oh yeah, he's a. He's a, a very good tailor. Yeah. Very tailor. very good. Everything and, is hand sewn and mm -hmm. made. He won't wear anything <clears throat> other than what he's made. So so <clears throat> that they know who we're talking about in the voting video, what was he wearing? Uh, he was wearing the brown tailcoat. He was the one that <clears throat> opened in the in the video. Okay. And he was also the one that uh, took our registration papers. Right. And then Donna, I believe she had on, she would have been the first, no, the second lady. She was the second lady. Second that lady was to come walking behind in, the lady in the brown in the with purple. a. It was either gray or red. In front of shawl. candy. Yeah, in front of candy. Right, but they're that very nice people. Yeah. Very so nice. So we're very fortunate they gave us a bed. Yeah, and the deal with that is that. He gave you this bed so that you could fix a rope bed, right, that he also owns. So he he will yeah. actually bring these rope beds with him to reenactments mm -hmm. and assemble them there. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll stay like he'll stay there for two to five days to make it somewhat worth his time to do that. Yeah, they set up a big tent that's like a twenty by right. thirty. They, they live crazy. like princes and we are we have this tiny little tent and then we look over and it's like this huge tent and it has multiple rooms in the tent yeah. and a full bed <laughs> there's a living room and a bedroom in the tent they're the real deal <laughs> they're the real deal and they know what they're doing he's but, also got a really awesome wagon oh he has an yeah. amazing wagon I know you guys would love that I don't have any pictures of it to share I, though I don't either you guys yeah. have to come to uh <clears throat> The Fort Rendezvous, or it'll be at a uh, Pioneer Days at Can and Candy's uh, shop. Right, there's an event that's gonna be at Candy shop that Ron he helps to organize that one. I think it was even his idea. Yeah, it was me and Candy. Right, so there's a reenactment hmm. that they do. It's a really loose one. It's not strict. It's just 18th to early 19th century. Pioneer to, ways. Yeah, to celebrate the history of Saint early Saint Genevieve. And and show off the skills and. People that are dressed up for history are welcome to camp or demonstrate. Uh, so, like, right. like blacksmith, um, the, the muzzle loading weapons, mm -hmm. uh, woodworking, uh, wool spinning. Uh, there, there's a fair trade. Plants. Guys, plants, People yeah. People bring plants. Yeah. They sell little plants. Um, like horning or scrimshaw working right. with horn. Mm -hmm. there, there's all kinds of stuff. And uh, this year we're going to have. Uh, even more than last year. And last year, I'd say we had food. a thousand visitors come through. Yeah, there's going to be food. So this is the second annual on, uh, it's going to be May 14th and 15th. Uh, it's called Pioneer Days in St. Genevieve, Missouri. Yeah, it's behind Candy's <laughs> store. You can find the address to that on Facebook. There's an event made uh, called Pioneer right. Days. Right, and actually the address that we get our things sent to is Candy's store. Yep. So if you go to our uh, either his channel, Frontier Patriot, or mine, Early American, if you go to the About tab, mm -hmm. you scroll down a little bit, it'll say an address there. That's our mailing address, but we don't actually live there. That's Candy's store. Yep. So that's where it's going to be at. She has a really big grassy field behind the mm -hmm. store, and that's where it's going to be. We're going to set up a tent. Oh, and... we're also going to have the uh, the horses and carriages there too, giving uh, carriage rides. Right. 
And my personal favorite is this year we're getting the guy that makes homemade, homemade root beer. Yeah, yeah, he was at the That is rendezvous. on another level. People come there and they buy gallons of it. It's, really uh, good. it's very, very cheap. It is. Surprisingly. He actually makes it from the 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 root beer root. Root. <laughs> I don't I'm not I, sure. I don't know what it's called. I know I've been digging before and I've hit roots and it smells like root beer, so maybe it really comes from a root. Maybe right. do research on it. But that. it is the it does actually come from a root originally, but I think the ones you get in the store nowadays are artificially flavored. Oh, yeah. Are there only maybe one percent real and then ninety nine percent artificial. This is it's so way better. Good. It is the best root beer I've ever had. Root beer from a store, I can only take a little sip of it. It's too sweet, and it's very carbonated, like we, soda. I don't like that. Yeah, we don't drink a lot of soda. No, I don't like that carbonation in my mouth. It feels like I'm drinking TV static. It's just weird. <laughs> right, <laughs> but this guy's root beer. It's so mildly sweet. It's smooth. It's not carbonated at all. It is the best root beer. It is. I mean, I, I left there with two wine glassfuls, not wine glass, wine, wine bottles, bottles wine bottles. full of it, and that's considered the low medium size. I believe the bottles, a wine bottle, uh -huh. they're maybe, what, $4? Right, you, a whole wine bottle is like $4. And you come back for a refill for like maybe $3. $3, If yeah, you bring it's... the glass back, it's less money. But yes. you can buy a size about this much. That's the smallest size for $2 or something. And then the wine bottle is four dollars, I think. Don't quote me, but it's around that price. And then the mm -hmm. largest one is yeah, they like got the, a moonshine jug. Yeah, they they've got a moonshine size ones up there. For they don't give those jugs away, but they got dollars. Yeah, but they're they're glass. They're glass. Yeah. They're, they look like those, but they're made out of glass. Same they're the size. same size, and they're like twelve dollars. Yeah. And if you come back for a refill, which Lord, I don't it's know like why maybe, you would. That's it's like a lost drink. Eight dollars to refill or something. It's yeah. crazy. But it's I, really good. I guess if you were splitting it with your whole family, you could come back the same day yeah. for a refill. One it's bottle's that good. good enough for us. You drink too much, you will get a bellyache. I regret not buying more, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. But it, it should be a, a great event. <laughs> yeah, it will be a great event. It'll be my second time going. The first one was good. Yeah. A lot of our friends go, and new reenactors that become our friends, so it's nice. <laughs> We're all kind of one big family. A lot of reenactors, they know each other. Mm -hmm. And they all travel from state to state. So we could go to a reenactment in, let's say, Wyoming or something. And then you see people <laughs> there that you know. And you didn't plan this out before at all. And you're like, oh, hey, how you doing? You know, it's crazy. If we go to Wyoming, I guess we're a gold rush or cowboys Maybe. or something. Maybe. I just said a <laughs> random state. I don't know. But it could be... We'd still, somebody Any would city. know us probably, because there's a lot of people that do multiple periods. Oh, yeah. We do multiple periods. But we're not mm -hmm. s multiple centuries, you know, World War II, um, Civil War. Well, I, I, I do two centuries. Right. Well, mm -hmm. well, I mean, over 100 years, like our friends do. Right. Some other people that right. do yep. some a 200-year span. Some people, they'll do literally everything that's in the history of the United States. It's a lot of money. Yeah, to get all the outfits mm -hmm. for that and just the little fine details. The Plus, <laughs> you have to be very passionate about that period, too, to do it. And have a lot of free time because, mm -hmm. you know, there's something going on all the all time. All the time. If, and, if you're open-minded to each time period, there's something going on all mm -hmm. the time. Winter, summer. Yeah, and it's not all in the same spot, so you're mm -hmm. driving. Summer in Europe. <clears throat> I know some reenactors that are American based and they will mm. literally get on a plane and go to Europe because there's an event. And they do that two or three times a year. Some of these same people that will go to Europe and whatnot, they're so dedicated to it that they will actually sleep out in trenches. If they're doing a World War I reenactment, for example, they will sleep in a trench in the middle of February mm. in the coldest parts of England or whatnot, <laughs> or France. It's crazy. Well, <laughs> we ready to hop off here? Yes, we are. The food's gone, so yeah, we're it's, gone. <laughs> it's her time to do the dishes this time. It is. And then uh, mm -hmm. we're going to retire to our new comfy bed. Yes, it is really nice. So until next time, mm -hmm. take care, guys. Thanks for watching. Take care.